Good afternoon. I'm Jim Foster, director of the City Club. I'm delighted to welcome you to this City Club forum, especially on a snowy February day in Cleveland, a weather pattern that we share with our sister city to the northwest, Detroit, the subject of today's forum and our speaker's home. I'm also appreciative of our speaker driving down from Detroit to Cleveland this morning, not all that long a drive, to join us for this special forum. I learned of George Glaster and his book through a Clevelander, Mark Joseph, who has known our speaker for a number of years. Dr. Mark Joseph is an associate professor at the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences at Case Western Reserve University and director of the National Initiative on Mixed Income Communities. He has been working with Dr. Gallister in a variety of national and international academic and policy settings for well over a decade. And I know that Mark considers him to be a treasured mentor and colleague. And so we appreciate Mark. Uh, and, and Mark's inviting George to Cleveland. And Mark will do the introduction to today's forum. Mark? Thanks, Jim. Good afternoon. It is truly a pleasure to be able to introduce my friend, Dr. George Goster. George has written a fabulous book on a very important American city, and so I'm going to keep this short so that he can have as much time as possible to talk with you all. Um, as you know from his bio in your program, he is the Clarence Hilbury Professor of Urban Affairs at Wayne State University, where he's been since 1996. He's a proud Case Western Reserve alum, and his PhD is from MIT. You also know that he is staggeringly prolific. He's written over 120 articles and eight books. You may not know that he is a rare economist who delves deeply into other disciplines. He's a highly sought off after international and national consultant with razor sharp insights and wit. And I learned only after reading his recent book, quite a poet and music aficionado. His latest book is Driving Detroit, Quest for Respect in the Motor City. It is both clinical in its objective and often devastating analysis of Detroit's rise and fall, and also deeply personal in its obvious affection for the culture and soul of this troubled city. Today's topic is of critical relevance to all of us as we chart a path forward both in our own challenged Midwestern city of Cleveland and on issues of race, class, and urban revitalization across America. Please welcome George Galster. Thank you very much, Jim, for the wonderful opportunity to speak to the Cleveland City Club. Thank you, Mark, for that very thoughtful introduction. Good afternoon to all of you. It's always a pleasure to be back in the Buckeye State not only as a graduate of Case Western Reserve and Wittenberg Universities, but also as a son of Toledo, Ohio. Although I have to say, in deference to my current home state, that I did see a sign of intelligent life there just this morning. <laughs> it said, Ohio State Line, 50 miles. <laughs> Think about that. OK. Today, I would like to paint a portrait for you. It is a diagnostic portrait, an MRI, if you will, of Southeast Michigan. And like any portrait, uh, it could be romantic, sort of like a John Singer Sargent painting, or it could be grotesque, like a Francis Bacon painting. I'll let you judge which is the more appropriate metaphor here. But what I am for sure going to aim for is a revealing portrait that scrapes below the surface of the paint and reveals something about the soul of the subject in question. So today I want to engage with the question, why is Detroit the way it is? What drives Detroit? I'm going to start by positing that Detroiters, like people everywhere, have fundamental human needs, which I'm going to term respect. But Metro Detroit has consistently frustrated our attempt to get these human needs through three forces. One, the economic engine of anxiety. Two, the housing disassembly line. And three, the dual dialectic of power struggles. 
These frustrations have led us to adapt as best we can, both as individuals and through our collective actions. Individually, we have created oppositional identities and scapegoating, and collectively, we have hyperunionization, segregation, jurisdictional fragmentation, and identity politics. Now, all these adaptations are understandable, but unfortunately, when you put them all together, they're collectively irrational. That's my story. Let me try to unpack it for you. What do Detroiters seek? Like citizens of metropolitan areas everywhere, we seek to obtain, retain, and expand three classes of resources. Physical resources, basic food, clothing, shelter, time, and energy. Social resources, love, status, affirmation, a sense of community. And psychological resources, identity, esteem, efficacy, and purpose. I'd like to bundle these resources under a term called respect. Truth be told, I'm stealing this term from Detroit's most famous sociologist. I refer to Aretha Franklin. <laughs> of course, the song of the same name was made famous. And in 1967, a month after Aretha Franklin's respect hit the top of the pop charts, an interesting historical event happened. The city broke out in the most destructive riot in then the nation's history. Accidental? I think not. Our quest for respect has been systematically frustrated. It's been frustrated by, first of all, our economic base, what I call the economic engine of anxiety, a dominant oligopoly that produces a durable good. Yeah, you know what it is. It's the automobile. Secondly, it's been frustrated by a bizarre housing system that produces a constant excess supply of housing at the suburban fringe and creates a disassembly line for housing. And thirdly, it's frustrated by the dual dialectic of power struggles, black-white in one dimension, capital labor in the other dimension. Let me unpack each of these three frustrating forces briefly. First of all, the economic engine of anxiety. The economic resources of everybody in the region is constantly threatened because of our singular dependence for a century on an industry which has great cyclical instability and secular decline. By cyclical instability, I mean durable goods producers suffer much bigger swings of up and down boom and bust cycles than the economy as a whole. That creates insecurity superimpose that upon a long-term pattern of decline over time of employment in that industry, and you have the recipe for anxiety. To give you some sense of this decline in employment in manufacturing in Detroit, look at the last post-war period. In 1947, Detroit had 333,000 manufacturing jobs. In the most recent census, 23,000. If that weren't bad enough, the social and psychological resources are threatened all the time because of the de-skilling, dehumanizing, and dangerous nature of work on an assembly line. I can tell you, I've done it. It is awful. If that weren't bad enough, the industry has a long history of oppressive management practices. And that is basically summarized in the James Johnson case. Now, James Johnson was a black auto worker who had served for many years in the Eldon Avenue Chrysler plant on the east side of Detroit. In 1971, his foreman insulted him for the final time. And in classic American style, what did he do? He went out and bought a rifle. And he took it back to the factory and shot his foreman dead. And for good measure, shot another one. He was arrested and, of course, charged with murder. In a stroke of defensive genius, his lawyer got the court, including the judge and the jury, to go to the Eldon Avenue factory to see the conditions there. Guess what? The jury found James Johnson not guilty for reason of insanity. Literally, working in an auto plant can drive you insane. Then we have the second frustrating force, our housing disassembly line. Suburban new construction in excess of regional household formation. We build 
thousands of houses on spec, even though there aren't people to fill them overall in the region. That excess supply of housing sets in motion a chain of moves which ultimately vacates the least competitive housing which is located in the city of Detroit. So the developer on the fringe builds new housing. He can certainly sell those. People occupy those, but they have to get rid of their old house to move up. So they price their old house so it can sell, and somebody moves up into their house because they think that's a step up for them. But then they have to turn around and do the same thing. They have to price their house so it can sell, and so forth, until this whole chain of moves works its way up until you get to the very bottom. And the owner of that least competitive house, located in the least competitive neighborhood, in the least competitive municipality, goes, I don't have anyone to fill my house. And so what happens? Ultimately, they will quit maintaining that building. Ultimately, if they can't find anybody to occupy it, it will be abandoned. It will be left to rot on the landscape. It will be turned over by default to the city. That, of course, has tremendously perverse consequences for the tax base of the city. As it loses people, it loses its income tax base. As it loses its property values, and especially if the property is abandoned, it loses its property tax base. That forces a cutback in the quality and the constancy of public services in the jurisdiction. That erosion of the quality of life in the city of Detroit, of course, increases the demand for suburban housing as more people want to get the heck out of Dodge. That just perpetuates the disassembly line. New houses drop onto the conveyor belt in the suburbs and push off the oldest houses into oblivion that happen to be located in the core of the metropolitan area. This, of course, imposes huge burdens on all populations, not only in the core, but throughout the region. All homeowners see their property values reduced below what they would otherwise be because of this perpetual excess supply of housing. All neighbors see the qu quality and consistency of their neighborhood changing as more people come in. Eventually, they're going to be of somewhat lower income than the original residents, and God forbid in Detroit, they might even be of a different racial or ethnic group. All of this leads to tremendous insecurity generated by our housing disassembly line. Now, let me give you some facts to support each of the key links that I've just made in this logical chain. Excess supply of construction. 10,000 extra housing units have been produced in our region for the last half a century per year. Every year, the three-county region of southeast Michigan has produced 10,000 more dwelling units than there were households to fill them. You will mathematically require that 10,000 housing units be abandoned. Are there under-maintained, vacant, and abandoned buildings in Detroit? Anyone who's been there knows it's true. 30% of the land area of the municipality of Detroit is now vacant land, and another 8% is occupied by dwellings that need to be demolished. Has that ruined the tax base of the city? Absolutely. The city is teetering on bankruptcy. We have billions of dollars in debt, and the state's talking about an emergency financial manager. Does that lead to a greater demand for suburban housing? Absolutely. People have been fleeing the city in droves. Detroit has now lost 60% of its population since its peak in the early 1950s. The third frustrating force is the dual dialectic, I call it, of power struggles between capital and labor and black and white that have ripped at our souls, again, for almost a century. The capital-labor power struggle is epitomized by the bloody 1930s. These are pictures from the Battle of the Overpass, where United Auto Workers organizers headed by President Walter Ruther were beaten up by thugs hired by Ford Motor Company in violation of their First Amendment rights. After World War II, the power struggles continue in a less violent way, but capital kept fighting through such forces as automation, factory relocation, international outsourcing, contract concessions that were forced by the bankruptcy court, essentially emasculating the labor movement such that the United Auto Workers are now only 73% of the size that they used to be in their peak of 1970. The black-white power struggles 
also have a violent history. These struggles are manifested in a race riot as early as 1833, quickly followed by one in 1863 on soon thereafter the Emancipation Proclamation, 1943 and 1967. Detroit holds a dubious record. It by far has had to have federal troops called out to quell a race riot more than any other American city. Four times in our history has this been required. After 1973, with the election of our first black mayor in the city of Detroit, Coleman Young, the struggle is now less violent, and it's taking the form of city-suburb polarization segregation intensified by race and income. A picture is worth a thousand words, and if you see a picture of Southeast Michigan's three counties and you color code it with yellow being majority white neighborhoods, green being majority black neighborhoods, and fuchsia, or purple being majority Hispanic neighborhoods, you see a stark contrast between the city of Detroit, which is almost perfectly outlined by the green and the suburbs, which are overwhelmingly white. The city of Detroit now is, is probably about 82% occupied by African Americans, 15% occupied by Hispanics, a completely minority center city surrounded by white suburbs. Do you know what percentage of the white people of the region still live within the boundaries of the city of Detroit? Four. Only 4% 4 of the region's white folks live in the city of Detroit. There is one place in Detroit which represents these dual dialectics of power struggle in an iconic way. It is the half mile long site of Packard Motor Car Company, which has been bankrupt since 1956. But in 1943, this was one of the key linchpins of the arsenal of democracy, because at this factory working three shifts 24 seven came aircraft engines. Now, management at this time was so desperate for labor that they were going to the rural south and pulling whatever warm bodies they could get, black or white, off the farms into the factories. They were even, for heaven's sakes, bringing women into the labor force. Who would have thunk it? <laughs> but they were smart enough to realize that race was important. And so they rigidly segregated the occupations within this factory, only giving the worst jobs to the black folks. They made a huge mistake in April of 1943 when they promoted three, count them, three black men from the maintenance department to work on the assembly line next to the white workers. In protest, the white workers staged a wildcat strike, that means unsanctioned by the union, and shut the plant down. The union told them to go back to work. United Auto Workers Solidarity, boys, we are all proletarian brothers to which the white workers gave, I'm sure, a rude gesture, which I will not repeat for you at the moment. Management asked them to go back to work. Franklin Roosevelt, the president, asked them to go back to work. Nope, they stayed out, being harangued by their strike leader, who capped one of his rhetorical excesses with the following phrase. Now, we need to offer a disclaimer at this point. The following phrase, which I will quote verbatim, is rude. I need to say it anyway, as you'll see. The white hate strike leader said, and I quote, I would rather have Hitler win the war than work next to a nigger, unquote. In Detroit, racism trumps patriotism. What have I said so far? I have argued that our quest for respect has been frustrated by our economic engine of anxiety, our housing disassembly line, and the dual dialectic of power struggles. These have created insecurity in our livelihoods, our neighborhoods, our home values, our social status, our self-esteem, and our personal safety. Detroit is a place that deeply disrespects the individual. It gives you a punch in the gut every single day. So what? Well, Detroiters are tough folks. They don't take this crap lying down. We're going to adapt. We're going to get respect somehow. We do it, first of all, by individual psychological adaptations. We 
engage in oppositional identity formation. By that, I mean that we don't necessarily define ourselves by the positive traits that our group has. We define it by the traits that we don't have, meaning we're not like you. We're better than you, and you know, absolutely better than you. And so if you're in that kind of mindset, that means if you're into a zero-sum mentality. We can't let you get ahead or you get ahead because that means I'm going to fall farther behind. Now, an example of that is in 2005. Put before the entire region was a simple proposition of an excise property tax amounting to only $60 a year that homeowners would have to pay into a kitty which would be distributed to support cultural institutions throughout the three-county region. The counties outside the city of Detroit voted it down, not seeing any interest in supporting cultural institutions in the center city of Detroit, because that's where they thought most of the money was going to go. But the center city plays that same zero-sum mentality when the same year. Councilman Alonzo Bates, when trying to approve a request by a white developer to buy some of the surplus city land and build new housing on it within the city of Detroit, instead of praising the developer, criticized the developer with the following line. I know what you're up to. Now that the city is worth something, you want to take it back from us, don't you? Zero sum mentality. The second thing we do well is scapegoat. We don't want to look in the mirror to see where the problem lies. We want to look someplace else. And both races do that through the form of accusations of what I call space rape. Each group says that the other group is responsible for disrespecting hallowed ground. Here's the way the whites play it. Oh, I just visited my old neighborhood in the city of Detroit where I grew up and where my grandmother used to live. It's a disaster. Clearly, you black folks don't know how to run a city. It's your fault. Blacks play it this way. Hey, whitey, you left the city. You took all your money and resources. You never come back. You're responsible for this place being a whole accusations of raping my space. But we also adapt collectively. We adapt as a group to try to find ways to get some of these resources. So we are heavily unionized, even though not as much as in the past. We are heavily segregated. By most measures, we are the most racially segregated region in terms of our neighborhoods and in terms of our schools in the United States. Fragmentation. In southeast Michigan, we have 221 separate units of government, each doing their own little thing because people want to have control over something, at least, in their lives. And last, we engage in identity politics. We vote for the person who can somehow appeal to who we think we want to be. And as a classic illustration of that, I give you the re-election campaign of former Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, who was losing badly in the early polls to his challenger by the name of Freeman Hendricks, who was also a famous black man with a very strong history of public service in the city of Detroit. What's Mayor Kilpatrick going to do to fight off this challenger? Ah, he's going to play the race card. Wait a minute. His challenger's black. How does he do that? Simple. He finds that his opponent's background is that he is the son of a black GI stationed in Germany and a white German mother. Aha, Kwame goes. I know how to get him. I'll remind everybody that he's not a true black man. He's only half black. And so from that point on in the campaign, Kwame never referred to his opponent by anything more than his first name, which was never more than an abbreviation, Helmut. Don't vote for Helmut. Vote for the real black man, Kwame Kilpatrick. Kwame, of course, was reelected overwhelmingly, soon thereafter going to prison. What happens when we undertake all of these kinds of adaptations? We get ourselves in a situation called collective irrationality. By this, I mean that individuals make rational adaptations to their frustration through these kinds of mechanisms. And for them, it makes sense until everyone else does it. And when everyone else does it, it frustrates everyone's efforts to gain respect. That's collective irrationality, a homely example. If I'm trying to catch fish because I'm hungry, I'm going to go out day after day into a lake and catch all the fish I can. That makes sense if I'm the only one doing it. If everybody does the same thing, pretty soon the fishing stock is decimated, no more breeding stock, everybody goes hungry. That's the situation we're in in Metro Detroit. 
collective irrationality frustrates every Metro Detroiter's quest for respect in three ways. First of all, it erodes our quality of life in the region. Secondly, it reduces our region's economic competitiveness. And thirdly, it reduces the region's sustainability in terms of energy, land use, environmental impact. What should be done? Well, it's really hard to work out of this situation. Believe me, I'm not naive about this, but if I were the king of Michigan, here's what I would do tomorrow. First of all, it has to be at the Michigan level. It can't be at the local government level. It has to be a metro-wide solution. First of all, I would establish a growth boundary around Metro Detroit. I would get out a map and draw a nice line around the area saying, thou shalt not build anything outside this line. You've got to use all the vacant land inside this line first. Secondly, I would develop options for expanding the geographic scope of affordable housing. No longer concentrating affordable housing assistance in the core where we already have concentrated poverty by increasing options of moving it across the metropolitan area. For example, the low income housing tax credit program right now is overwhelmingly being utilized in the city of Detroit because of irrational incentives given to the developers to build it in core urban areas. Secondly, we should institute inclusionary zoning provisions, which force the developers of housing to set aside a small fraction of their buildings to sell or rent below the market value so that we can get more mixed income housing options where new housing is being built. Last but we, not least, we need to change a protected class in the state's fair housing law. Right now, it's perfectly legal for a landlord to say, oh, you get a Section 8 voucher or you get a welfare check. I can slam the door against you because I don't have to accept that as a source of income. That's not illegal. It should be. Last, we have to develop some kind of system for either tax-based sharing or serious statewide revenue sharing to equalize the fiscal disparities between jurisdictions like Detroit, which are on this death spiral of finances, and other jurisdictions across the state. That's unfortunately what needs to be done to collectively cure the collectively irrational position that we've gotten ourselves into. So what have I said thus far? What drives Detroit? Well, in my analysis, we start with basic psychology. Detroiters want to obtain, retain, and expand physical resources, social resources, and psychological resources, what I call a quest for respect. Unfortunately, our region has systematically frustrated our quest for respect for generations through our economic engine of anxiety, through our housing disassembly line, and through a dual dialectic of power struggles between capital and labor and black and white. We have adapted to this frustration through oppositional identity and scapegoating, through unionization, through segregation, fragmentation, and identity politics. Each of them seem rational on their own, but if you put them all together and everybody does it, we get a collectively irrational outcome, an outcome that ironically frustrates everybody's quest for respect, and thus driving our entire region to a dysfunctional state where we now are the international poster child of what not to have for a metropolitan area. Here comes the obligatory plug for the book. If you want to find out more about this story in much more interesting prose and poetry and song lyrics and oral history than I was able to give you today, this is the book for you. And let me leave you with this for a moment. I'd like you to listen to the first verse of this song with new ears. Just a little bit, that's what we need. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Um, today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring George, Gal George Galster, author of Driving Detroit, The Quest for Respect in the Motor City. 
We will return to our speaker momentarily for the traditional City Club questions and answers. Please formulate your questions now and remember to be brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those listening to 90.3 WCPN Idea Stream, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the media, many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WBIZ PBS Idea Stream. Television broadcasts are supported by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. And closed captioning of our programs is made possible by the Nordson Corporation. We welcome guests today at tables hosted by Case Western Reserve University and the Maxine Gunn Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State University. Thank you for your support. And now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club questions and answers. We welcome questions from everyone, including our guests. Holding the microphone today is our program director, Carrie Miller. First question, please. Unfortunately, sir, if I close my eyes during your candid presentation, I would believe you are describing Cleveland. I assume that the school cultures in metropolitan Detroit and Cleveland are very similar. We have found several lectures about the federal government encouraging the states to modify testing and teaching procedures and so forth. However, my church is 10 blocks from an inner city K through 8 school, a marginal school. Our problems are fatherless families headed by someone who failed to graduate from high school with little or no food on the weekends. No food on the weekends. And my question is, is not that similar in Detroit and how have you attacked it? Indeed, many of the same structural forces and visible consequences of dysfunction that I described today describe Cleveland and other Midwestern cities. We perhaps are more extreme in Detroit than we are elsewhere, but some of the fundamental forces and symptoms are exactly the same. I can't say that we have done anything very well in Detroit, so I wouldn't want to use any of the actions that we've taken as illustrative best practices that would be transmitted appropriately to Cleveland. What I would urge is that all of us think about more than Band-Aids. I'm not against Band-Aids. I believe that we should try to alleviate suffering to the extent we can. But it takes more than personal volunteerism and personal charity to change the structural forces that I've outlined. We can keep in place rules of the game about where development occurs, about how tax revenues are, ch are shared, and we will keep producing generation after generation the kind of children and families that you've talked about, sir. That's our true choice in today's society. We can continue to rely on charity and Band-Aids, or we can try to get at the underlying disease by changing the rules of the game of how we build cities. Well, George, assuming your <clears throat> three-point plan is not likely to be adopted very soon, although I would certainly support it, and assuming Detroit's left to its own fate, uh, could you compare the uh, Mayor Bing's Neighborhood Detroit Works program with um, Dan Gilbert's activities in downtown Detroit and give us a sense of uh, what you think of those two initiatives. Starting with the second part of your question first, uh, as many of you know, Dan Gilbert is doing center city revitalization activities in Detroit, similar to how he has done in the past in Cleveland. He owns a large share of properties, which he is trying to redevelop into offices retail and residential to create a 24-hour vital work live space in the heart of Detroit. This is a noble effort. I applaud it. It is heading in the right direction in terms of trying to help attract and keep to our region our best and brightest youth, which right now are flooding out of the region as soon as they get their degrees to head to greener pastures of, no, not Cleveland or Toledo, but Portland, Chicago, Boston, New York, San Francisco. We need a cool place to keep them occupied, to keep them here in Southeast Michigan, just like you need to keep them here as well, because these young people will be the next Henry Fords, inventing who knows what, but the odds of them coming up with the next big thing are improved if we keep more of them and their brains and their entrepreneurial spirits home instead of letting them run away to these hot cities. 
And the effort to create cool urban environments like Dan Gilbert is trying to do is a step in the right direction. However, that's only a very small step, and that alone I can't see rescuing the city of Detroit as a whole, because the rest of the 133 square miles of this place is pretty desolate and is pretty generic, consisting of nondescript bungalows that are quickly running to the end of their life. And those neighborhoods are depopulating rapidly. We're losing about 1,000 people per month net from those neighborhoods. So despite Dan Gilbert's efforts to bring into the core a few extra 1,000 people, you can see what he's up against. It's like the bathtub with the drain open, and you're trying to pour a little water into the top, but still the bathtub's getting emptier and emptier and emptier. And so the fundamental rules of the game are still working against the success of the Dan Gilberts. So in light of that, Mayor Bing proposed when he was first elected to have a right-sizing effort to bring the city services to a more appropriate scale. Instead of serving these low-density neighborhoods where maybe only a couple of households still lived, he wanted to encourage those people to leave those places, move to the neighborhoods where they're still viable and could use a couple of extra households moving in, and shut off city services to the now empty neighborhoods, converting them to parks, wetlands, forests, retention ponds, you name it. And that's the recent plan that just was revealed in the city of Detroit. Again, that's not fundamentally going to change the fate of Detroit, in my opinion. It's going to beautify decline, <laughs> but that's all it's going to do at best. It's not changing the fundamental forces which are sucking population out of the city, and those forces are happening on the fringe by unbridled speculative development, and until that stops, we're going to eventually cover all of Detroit with forests, parks, and retention ponds. George, you laid out a very ambitious reform program, very similar to the one we have here in our neck of the woods. Uh, what institutions do you see as critical to leading the push on these major reforms? Institutionally, I think that if a coalition of center city legislators and inner ring sub suburban legislators who are all starting to feel tangibly the results of this suburban expansion problem that we're still all suffering. That could be part of that political coalition that comes together, but there could be some very unusual and unexpected compatriots in this effort. Think of the green folks who want to preserve the environment. Think of the hunting lobby that wants to preserve the virgin territory around a city. Think of the farm lobby that wants to preserve farms. They are all allies in this, for, in this fight. Think of every homeowner in the region. Right now, the system that we have is stripping equity from every existing homeowner in the region. Slowly but surely, your houses are being worth less than they otherwise would be. So I would try to get every homeowner in the region behind an act of the legislature called the Homeowner Equity Restoration Act. And under the guise of a Homeowner Equity Restoration Act, we would institute this growth boundary and somehow limit this excessive development on the fringe, slow down this excess supply of housing, which is deflating everybody's housing values, and thereby making every existing homeowner better off. There's a whole bunch of homeowners that vote Let's try to reveal to them where their self-interest lies. A lot of the cities that you mentioned that have, have been successful have been successful because of the immigration into those cities, New York being a prime example. Uh, those are the people who come in and buy those houses, revitalize those houses. Is there any move in Detroit to attract immigrants from abroad to populate the city and the region? There is indeed a relatively new public relations effort that is attempting to draw more immigration into Metro Detroit. It has barely gotten off the ground, and it's running against a very strong current of anti-immigrant sentiment that has been made very clear by Detroit City Council in a number of votes over the years. Uh, the most recent and most egregious example was in 2005, when City Council explicitly out of jealousy and fear of 
other minority groups besides blacks in the city of Detroit owning many of the retail stores, liquor stores, fast food outlets to be precise, uh, passed an ordinance, clearly illegal, which was give economic development subsidies only to black owned entrepreneurs. And so with that kind of message, it's tough to get a public relations campaign that says, oh, please come to Detroit, international immigrant. We're a welcoming place. A recent study has just been done by my colleague at Wayne State that looked at the different factors that drive where immigrants want to live. And of course, job opportunities are one, entrepreneurial opportunities are two, but quality of residential life is three. And unfortunately, Detroit doesn't look really good on all three of those key criteria. So it's a crucial part of economic development. It's just another tough sled for us in Detroit to achieve that. Thank you for your uh, crystal clear analysis. The uh, solutions or the remedies that you speak to seem to be uh, primarily um, uh, establishing quotas to help with economic integration and reducing urban sprawl. Wondering if you could speak to those real cultural and interpersonal issues of the uh, dual dialectics between capital and labor and black and white. You're absolutely right that interpersonal dynamics are part of our problem in Metro Detroit because we are so adept at doing them and us. That can be along class lines or it can be along race lines, often both. City, suburb, black, white, rich, poor, capital labor, those are the labels that Detroiters in the region use to view things that separate us, that somehow make us uncommon. My hope is that by changing the rules of the game in the ways I've suggested, we will start to be clear about how our destinies are in fact shared. If we share our spaces in a different way, if we meet one another and intertwine with one another in economic and social ways that we haven't in the past. And so, sure, public relations campaigns to try to get people to talk to one another and change people's attitudes are valuable, but I think the way that we arrange our geographic space and the rules that govern how those spaces relate to each other are equally important structural features in changing how people ultimately relate to one another. And that's why I'm trying to advocate for the latter. Dr. Galster, welcome to Cleveland. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time for us. Ohio voters recently passed uh, changes to the Ohio Constitution that allowed for casino gambling establishments to be built in Cleveland and other urban areas in the state. I was just wondering, one of the things we've always looked to is Detroit and you know the, the gaming industry, and this is supposed to be a panacea. And can you kind of touch on you know what was the what's the promise and what's the reality of of the kind of the economic impact on that and what we may be seeing in the near future? First of all, I would I'd very much like to thank Ohio for stealing all those Ohio gamblers that used to come to Detroit. <laughs> I suppose they were yours to keep, so we're, we were stealing them from you. The casino issue, obviously, is one that was hailed as a prime vehicle of economic development in Detroit in the late 1990s when they three of them were approved, the, the only licenses in the state that were approved not being on Native American reservations. It was a statewide ballot that granted Detroit these three licenses because they were a special case, because the state said this was going to help Detroit grow economically, their tax base. And it seemed like a, a good deal when we first came in because the deal cut with the casinos is that the city would get 10% of the gross revenues of each casino. And given that each casino has been pulling in about a million dollars a day, that's 300,000 for the city coffers. Seems like a great deal, but of course, in its wisdom, the city said after it gave us these three licenses, excuse me, the state said after it gave the city these three licenses, now you don't need as much revenue sharing from us. So we'll cut your revenue sharing. Thanks very little. Then what, of course, is not clear is how much of the life of the casinos is in fact bringing new money into the city, i.e. from Ohio and out of state, out of the city of Detroit, versus simply reshuffling money within the region. 
Uh, if it's just reshuffling money within the region, then it's not economic development at all. It's stealing money away from other restaurants and other entertainment venues that would have been there providing jobs and tax revenues otherwise. How much of this zero-sum game is going on is never easy to tell because, of course, the casinos are extremely secretive about where their customers are coming from, and the external costs imposed by casino gambling in terms of encouraging binge gambling and what that means for families and other kinds of uh, safety issues, very hard to calculate. Uh, it perhaps could be an economic development tool on very selective circumstances, like if they were the only ones doing it in the nation. But as soon as everybody starts to do it, then it's a, a race to the bottom. And you're adding all these social burdens without anybody getting any net gain from it. And I think that's the point we're getting to pretty closely now with most of the Midwest having casinos. So uh, better be early than late into that game. So I don't hold a lot of hope for Ohio's casinos in that regard. Dr. Galster, you mentioned just briefly suburban decline. Could you say some more? What is happening and why is it happening? The forces of the housing disassembly line are not limited by jurisdictional boundaries because the housing market is regional. A house built on the fringe of the metropolitan area is competing with houses elsewhere in the metropolitan area located miles and miles and miles away because households are making decisions that ultimately will affect all elements of the metropolitan area. So what that means is that eventually if this donut-shaped pattern of development continues with sprawl at the edge and nothing in the middle, that the edge of abandonment of where the least competitive houses and neighborhoods are falling into disrepair and then abandonment, that edge of abandonment will spread well outside the city of Cleveland or the city of Detroit into the next oldest, least competitive ring of suburbs. You know the names, the Maple Heights, the Cleveland Heights, the East Clevelands. They are subject to the same forces as the city of Cleveland has been subject to. That's why I think there might be a political coalition possible across city suburb boundaries that hasn't traditionally happened too much. But the point is that the problem is regional and doesn't respect any metropolitan jurisdictional subdivisions within it. Mr. Galster, thank you for <clears throat> such provocative thoughts, uh, which we very much take to heart for reasons that you've heard. And uh, I like your housing disassembly chain analysis. I think it, it carries, uh, it's very cogent. But I don't think I come out to the same remedy that you do. You put uh, growth boundary as your first bullet. And I think since Detroit is in Portland, the chance of a growth boundary around the city and prohibiting suburban development is almost nil. What I do think you mentioned is the Gilbert effort and perhaps others like him to redevelop parts of Detroit. may sound like a Herculean task, but in fact, if housing is going to age and going to become less competitive because it's older, it's maybe just tired, you have to have a redevelopment alternative to break the chain. Otherwise, the kind of cancer spreads, as you've described. And we know that dense cities can draw people in because we see it. Chicago, New York. In some way, I think Detroit has to become a redevelopment play rather than uh, some kind of, uh, rather than putting your hope in uh, limiting development in the suburbs. I completely agree with your conclusion that Detroit has to be a redevelopment play. I don't see it happening without the growth boundary, and here's why. Unlike the Chicago's and the New York's and the San Francisco's, there is not a vibrant job base in the core of Detroit, despite Dan Gilbert's efforts. There are very, very few jobs in the core of Detroit. The center business district of Detroit is only the third largest office concentration in the region. It's not the center anymore. The center is out in the fringe in Troy and Southfield. The other structural problems that I've elucidated make Detroit a very tough redevelopment option. We have beautiful sites 
going for the asking along the Detroit River. The land is essentially free, and yet no one can build profitably there. The rents or sales prices they can command are simply not high enough to induce this kind of construction. Why? Because think about what the potential demander is going to want to see. I can move into the city of Detroit, this demander says, and what am I going to get for this? Well, even if I work downtown, I'm going to get a much higher tax rate per thousand dollars of my property value than if I live nearby in a suburb. I'm going to pay much higher insurance rates for my car and my, my home. I'm going to pay an extra 3% of income tax that I wouldn't pay otherwise. And I have to put up with terrible city services. Besides that, it's a great place. The point is that economists would say, well, if the land prices fall far enough, you'll get development. Right now, land is free, and we're not getting development. The only way that we could get what little downtown development of residential that we've seen in the last few years is through blatant city subsidies. The Woodward Corridor, the David Broderick Tower, all these highly touted new redevelopments are great, except it's requiring thousands and thousands of city dollars, which the city doesn't have. So yes, develop the city is the key, but the economics of the situation under the current rules of the game make it infeasible for any but the most philanthropic developers to want to develop in the city of Detroit. That's the problem. Here we've spent a lot of our effort and um, emphasis on schools. Uh, and I would say that's probably the ma one of the major uh, things that we're working on, considering that vital to bringing people into the city or allowing people to stay. Tell me if Detroit has already done that or um, what kind of involvement you've had in that regard. Detroit has a horrible history of school reform, and it goes all the way back to the 1960s when after generations of blatant segregation by race of our schools, a progressive, reform-minded group was elected to the Detroit City School Board, and they created a desegregation plan for the city's schools. That was met with such popular opposition that in a special referendum, the reformers were thrown out, the old guard was put back in, and the civil rights community charged them with blatantly segregating the schools. The case went all the way up to the Michigan Supreme Court, which found indeed that the city was guilty and that there needed to be a region-wide redistribution of school children to create region-wide desegregation. That case was challenged in the Supreme Court, and in 1974, in the case Milliken v. Bradley, the Supreme Court, by one vote, overturned the Michigan Supreme Court and said only the city of Detroit is obligated to desegregate. You know what happened next. All the white parents ran away to the suburbs with their kids, and that's where they've been ever since. So since 1974, we have had an overwhelmingly black student body in the city of Detroit. We are now still the most segregated school district in the nation. That's not a problem per se, except that we are increasingly a poor black jurisdiction. Now 70% of the children of Detroit public schools are in free and reduced lunch. 50% of the adults in the city of Detroit are functionally illiterate. You can imagine what they teach their children. That's the challenge that, th that any school operating in the city of Detroit has today. What have we done? Not much. We've had a charter school movement, which the state legislature thought would be a great thing to do. They've had modest success, given the challenge, of course, facing them in the city of Detroit. Detroit public schools are dysfunctional beyond belief. On national test scores, they are right at the bottom of the league tables. The latest national test score for Detroit public school children was described by the head of the National Educational Association as these scores seemed as all they could have been due to chance, like the kids were just guessing at every question. 
That's where Detroit public schools are today. No, we are not doing anything well in that regard. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been listening to a Friday forum featuring George Galster, professor of urban affairs at Wayne State University and author of Driving Detroit, The Quest for Respect in the Motor City. Thank you, Professor Galster. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. PMC is proud to support the presentation of this City Club of Cleveland Friday Forum on WVIZ PBS. Additional support comes from Cleveland State University. Support for closed caption transcripts of City Club forums is provided by the Nordson Corporation Foundation.